In our previous lecture, we understood the little o notation. Not only we understood the little o notation, we also understood the relationship between the big O and the little o notation. Now in this lecture, we will understand the little omega notation. This is the new notation. And not only we will understand the little omega notation in this lecture, we will also understand the relationship between the big omega notation and the little omega notation in this lecture. So let's get started and let's see the topics. The first topic of this lecture is big omega notation recap. We will first get the quick recap of the big omega notation to properly understand the little omega notation. After the quick recap, we will proceed and understand the little omega notation in details and then finally we will understand the relationship between the little omega notation and the big omega notation. Now as we know what are the topics of this lecture, we are completely ready to tackle them one by one. Let's start with the first topic, big omega notation recap. This is the definition of the big omega notation. We already know this definition because we have understood the big omega notation in one of our lectures. According to this definition, we are assuming fn and gn are non-negative functions. fn is big omega of gn if and only if fn is greater than or equal to c times gn for all values of n where n is greater than or equal to n naught and C and N naught are constants. If this inequality is satisfied, if it is the case that Fn is greater than or equal to C times Gn, then we can say Fn is big omega of Gn, or in other words, Gn is the lower bound of Fn. From the graph also, it is clear that Gn is the lower bound of Fn, or in other words, we can observe that after n naught, fn grows asymptotically bigger than gn. So, this is the definition of the big omega notation. Within this definition, in this inequality, we can observe that gn is multiplied by some constant c. This constant must be a positive constant. This is what we learned already. So, c must be greater than 0. It cannot be even 0. Also, this inequality must be true for some c. It is not mandatory to check this inequality for all positive constants. We can take some positive constant c and multiply it by gn and check whether this inequality is satisfied or not. If this inequality is satisfied, then we can say fn is big omega of gn. I haven't mentioned this in this definition, but now it is important to mention that this inequality must be true for some c greater than 0 because it will play a crucial role in understanding the little omega notation. So now let me explicitly mention for some c greater than 0 in this definition. Now the definition is fn equal to big omega of gn if and only if fn is greater than or equal to c times gn for some c greater than 0 and for all values of n where n is greater than or equal to n naught and c and n naught are constants. I have added this part only for some c greater than 0. The rest of the definition is exactly the same. So this is the updated definition of the big omega notation. This inequality must be satisfied for some c greater than 0 and for all values of n greater than or equal to n naught. So now we know the exact definition of the big omega notation which will help us understand the little omega notation. So we are ready to move to the next topic where we will discuss the little omega notation. So now let's understand the little omega notation. Now here comes the definition of the little omega notation. Assuming fn and gn are non-negative functions, fn is little omega of gn if and only if fn is greater than c times gn. 
for all values of c greater than 0 and for all values of n greater than or equal to n0 and c and n0 are constants. By seeing this definition, we can spot the differences between the little omega notation and the big omega notation. The first difference we can observe is that in place of the big omega, we have little omega here. This is the symbol for little omega. Fn is little omega of Gn. This means Gn is the strict lower bound of Fn. We will understand the meaning of strict lower bound in a moment. The second difference is that in place of greater than or equal to in the inequality, we now have greater than symbol. So, the inequality is Fn greater than C times Gn. Recall in case of the big omega notation, we have Fn greater than or equal to C times Gn. But here we have Fn greater than C times Gn. Now, I hope you got the idea why Gn is called the strict lower bound of Fn. Because of this inequality, Gn is called the strict lower bound of Fn because Fn must be strictly greater than C times Gn. Or we can say C times Gn must be strictly less than Fn. Hence, we can say Gn is the strict lower bound of Fn. And the third difference is that in place of for some c greater than 0, we now have for all values of c greater than 0. So, this inequality must be satisfied for all positive constants c. This means this inequality must be true for all values of c greater than 0. Then only we can say fn is little omega of gn. But does that mean we need to check this inequality for all positive constants c? No, we do not have to check this inequality for all positive constants c. This is what we learned in the last lecture as well while discussing the little o notation. We learned that we do not have to put all values of c to check whether the inequality is true or not. Instead, we can select some arbitrary constant and prove that the inequality is true. And if we want to say it confidently whether fn is little o of gn or fn is little omega of gn, then we just need to carefully observe the functions. Most of the time by seeing the functions we can judge whether fn is little o of gn or whether fn is little omega of gn. So, Intuition plays a very important role here. And the understanding of different types of functions, that is polynomial functions, exponential functions, and many such functions, is important here. Comparing two polynomial functions is always easy. Similarly, if we want to compare a polynomial function with an exponential function, we know which one is bigger. So, if we have the understanding of different types of functions, then we can easily tell whether fn is little o of gn or whether fn is little omega of gn. We do not have to put all positive constants here. So, this is the most important takeaway of this lecture. Now, in order to concretize what I am saying, let's take a simple example. Let's say fn is n square and gn is n. These are the two functions. Now we need to tell whether fn is little omega of gn or not. For this, we need to check whether fn is greater than c times gn for all c greater than 0. As I have mentioned, we need to take one arbitrary constant c. So let us assume that c is 1000. This is just an arbitrary constant I have chosen. You can choose any constant. This is just a random number. If you remember in the previous lecture, I have selected 1 by 8 as c. But this time I have chosen c as 1000. It does not matter what constant we take. But c must be greater than 0. You need to select a positive constant only. Now, let's replace fn by n square. 
Gn by n and C by 1000. So we will get this inequality n square greater than 1000 n. In order to prove whether this inequality is true or not, we need to solve this inequality to find for which values of n this inequality will satisfy. We can observe we have n square in the left hand side and 1000 times n in the right hand side. We can cancel n from both the sides. We will be left with n in the left hand side and 1000 in the right hand side. So the inequality will be n greater than 1000. So for all values of n greater than 1000, this inequality is satisfied. Or in other words, we can say for all values of n greater than or equal to 1001, this inequality is satisfied. 1001 is 1 greater than 1000. So n naught is 1001. So one thing is clear, this inequality is true. But fn is greater than c times gn for c equal to 1000. What about other constants? We need to show that this inequality is true for all c greater than 0. But here we have chosen just one c. What about other positive constants? We do not have to worry about all the positive constants. Instead, just observe these two functions. We know fn is n square and gn is n. This is the linear function and this is the quadratic function. We know the growth rate of the quadratic function is greater than the growth rate of the linear function. So it is clear that n square is greater than n. No matter what constant we select here, the linear function cannot grow asymptotically bigger than the quadratic function. This is what we already know. Therefore, from our previous knowledge, we can say that fn is little omega of gn because n square is greater than n for all c greater than 0. So I hope now it is clear how to solve these type of problems. We now know exactly how to prove whether fn is little omega of gn or not. With this we have understood this topic, the little omega notation. Now let's understand the relationship between little omega and big omega notations. If fn is little omega of gn, then fn must also be big omega of gn. Why? If gn is the strict lower bound of fn, then gn must also be the lower bound of fn. This makes sense. I am saying the strict lower bound because we know the inequality is fn greater than c times gn or fn strictly greater than c times gn. That's why I am using the word strict lower bound for little omega notation. So if gn is the strict lower bound of fn, then gn must also be the lower bound of fn. Because if fn is greater than c times gn, then fn must also be greater than or equal to c times gn. But the opposite may or may not be true. If fn is big omega of gn, then it may or may not be true that fn is little omega of gn. If we are saying that fn is greater than or equal to c times gn, then it may or may not be true that fn is also greater than c times gn. It might be possible that these two functions, fn and gn, are same. If these two functions are same, then fn is big omega of gn or we can say gn is the lower bound of fn. But as we know, if the two functions are same, then fn is not little omega of gn because fn will not be strictly greater than c times gn. In order to understand what do I mean by this, let's take a simple example. Let's say fn is n and gn is also n. These two functions are exactly the same. They are linear functions. 
For c equal to 1, we can say fn is big omega of gn. Because we know the inequality is fn greater than or equal to c times gn. Either fn should be greater than c times gn or it should be equal to c times gn. For c equal to 1, we can observe fn is equal to c times gn. Because n is equal to n. Therefore, fn is big omega of gn. But can we say fn is also little omega of gn? No. For c equal to 1, fn is not equal to little omega of gn. For c equal to 1, these two functions are same. So, fn is not strictly greater than c times gn. And hence, we can say fn is not little omega of gn. Now, you might be thinking, we can take some other constant and prove that fn is little omega of gn. But no, recall that the inequality fn greater than c times gn must be satisfied for all values of c greater than 0 in case of little omega notation. In case of big omega notation, only one constant is enough. We can show that fn is greater than or equal to c times gn for some c greater than 0. But in case of little omega notation, we need to check the inequality for every positive constant c. Even if for one constant the inequality is not satisfied, then we can say fn is not little omega of gn. That is what we have done here. For c equal to 1, fn is not greater than c times gn. Hence, we can say fn is not little omega of gn. So, I hope the relationship between the big omega notation and the little omega notation is completely clear. With this, we are done with this topic also. And this means we are done with this lecture. Okay friends, this is it for now. Thank you for watching this presentation. I will see you in the next one.